Showtime! First, let me give a little bit of backstory. The most viewed video on my channel is one about the band King Crimson and the difficulties when it came to finding its work on YouTube. But since then, my approach to both scripting and editing has drastically improved and my mic quality isn't the worst thing ever anymore. So I've decided to remake the video with all the bells and whistles of my newer content. I hope you enjoy. Out of the vast cornucopia of genres on YouTube, music is the one that reigns supreme. And while you could easily use any other streaming service for your music needs, YouTube beats those services when it comes to the community aspect. As much as we all love to shit on YouTube's comment section, it can add a lot to the listening experience. I mean, if you're listening to We Fly High and you're not looking at comments about Chad Warden, are you even listening to the song at all? But there's a dark, seedy underbelly within the music side of YouTube. You see, many individuals are using the spear of the website to commit an unspeakable evil. And that evil is copyright infringement. In this modern day black market, there are three different routes that users could go down. First, there's a neutral ending where the re-uploaded music stays undetected forever. Then there's a lawful ending where the re-uploaded music gets claimed by the copyright holder and gets to stay up as long as the copyright holder gets money from ads. And finally, there's the chaos ending. Users on this path will have to deal with takedowns of their videos and sometimes their whole channels, but that's never the end of the story. Whenever a video gets taken down, there will be countless other people uploading it again. Because of all these re-uploads, manually trying to remove all traces of a song from YouTube has become increasingly difficult. That's why copyright takedowns have slowly become less prevalent than copyright claims, as the latter takes less effort and even results in bonus revenue. But for some people, the practicality of a copyright claim means nothing. It's not about effort or even money it's about sending a message. Robert Fripp is the founder and the face of King Crimson, one of the most influential bands in the prog rock genre. Fripp has a very complex philosophy when it comes to how he creates and distributes music, which is defined by his desire for as much creative control as possible. If you want to hear the specifics of his philosophy, I'll link a video by Sudium which covers the same topic as me, but from the perspective of Fripp's outlook on music. But one day, Fripp's philosophy would meet its greatest challenge, an obscure invention called the internet. Surprisingly, when it came to the internet, Fripp was actually ahead of the game. Before most artists even thought about using the internet, Fripp's record label established a website that served as an online marketplace and a comprehensive archive of King Crimson's history. And since its record label was specifically designed to go against the exploitation that was and still is common in the music industry, all was good. But unfortunately, this wouldn't last. The internet has evolved since then, and now streaming services like YouTube and Spotify offer most music for free. Robert Fripp, on the other hand, did not embrace these services. For most of the 2010s, the only two ways to purchase King Crimson music were through physical stores or through the DGM website. This is, of course, the result of Fripp's desire for creative control, but Fripp's opposition to streaming services would also cause physical sales of King Crimson albums to increase. Thus, a positive feedback loop was created and Fripp's policy would keep getting reinforced. So internet users did the natural thing and uploaded King Crimson songs to YouTube. However, what these internet users didn't know was that they were going to enter one of the most intense battles of attrition in all of human history. The first move of these users was to upload the music as is. Normal title, normal thumbnail. Fripp had other plans though. That was a bad move little ant. King Crimson was partnered with a company called Aviator Management, which describes itself as the world leader in the location and enforcement of audiovisual rights. As such, uploading unchanged King Crimson music would be equivalent to walking up to Robert Fripp and just asking him to give you a copyright claim. And so, the album cover for In the Court of the Crimson King became the face that launched a thousand re-uploads. The first notable re-upload was titled Not In the Court of the Crimson King. It employed a vast quantity of stealthy techniques, such as drawing an axe on the cover art and politely telling Robert Fripp that he should not interact. Fripp had finally met a worthy opponent, but in a surprising upset, Fripp easily located this re-upload and took it down in one fell swoop. To this day, military historians still debate over how Fripp managed his feet. Some believe he had a secret network of spies. Others believe he used some sort of supernatural ability to detect the re-upload. And finally, there was an outlandish theory going around that suggested that having the album's name in the title made it easy to find? Psst. As if. The re-uploaders decided that the best way to beat King Crimson was to up the intensity of their attacks and create disguises that were so brilliantly designed that Fripp could not keep up with them. These disguises are so brilliant, in fact, that attempting to find the words to describe them would be futile. So I figured that the best way to display the brilliance of these disguises would be to read their titles without any additional comments. 
Johann Sebastian Bach in the court of the Crimson King, first movement. Mobile suit ZZ Gundam opening one. It's not in the court of the Crimson King, fall album. Six Nine's greatest hits in the court of the Crimson King. In the court of the Pickle Rick. These disguises were incredibly potent and Fripp could have easily been overwhelmed. However, Aviator Management gave Fripp an important gift, extraordinarily powerful content ID. As a result, Fripp's ability to detect re-uploads became so powerful that the music could not be uploaded at all unless it was edited in some way. Re-uploaders were now put in a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation. They could upload the music as is and then immediately get taken down, or they could distort the music and make it impossible to listen to. It seemed like Fripp had earned a swift victory. Even when the re-uploaders tried to use other websites, they were hit with a Fripp special. But something was brewing underneath Fripp's nose. Word of Fripp's copyright tactics had started to spread across the internet. And the internet did what it normally did and made memes about the ordeal. Hmm, today I will listen to some King Clemson in the court of the Clemson King. Clueless. This image has been removed due to copyright infringement. Something about these memes caused the movement to change. It was no longer about listening to King Crimson's music, it was about defeating Robert Fripp. And so the re-uploaders were willing to make the music incomprehensible, as long as it was on the internet in some form. King Crimson in the court of the Crimson King, but after the 30s the tone changed. In the court of the Crimson King, but it's in worse quality to avoid Fripp. King Crimson in the court of the Crimson King, full album, but there's no sound. These fans went ahead and tried to hit Fripp as they were able, because they figured out that Mercy's off the table. Unfortunately for the re-uploaders, no matter what they did, Fripp would always be right there to meet them. All of these edits were taken down quickly, even the one with no sound wasn't safe, showing that no one could escape Fripp's wrath. It seemed like re-uploaders had no chance of victory, but at this point they were too stubborn to back down, and shortly enough, they prevailed. April 7, 2019, King Crimson to begin streaming entire studio catalog. The band had already tested the waters in June of 2017 by uploading some live releases to Spotify. In 2019, they celebrated their 50th anniversary by uploading similar releases to YouTube. And in June of the same year, all of the band's studio albums would finally make it to Spotify. Upon this announcement, David Singleton, the band's manager, remarked that the pros of screaming had begun to outweigh the cons. Immediately, the re-uploads had ceased, and the re-uploaders themselves could go home and listen to King Crimson in peace. While it's unlikely that they were the main reason for the band's sudden shift in policy, I like to think that they played some small role. In fact, this whole story serves as an interesting case study in terms of how piracy should be dealt with. At the end of the day, that one Gabe Newell quote that everyone reposts still stands true. Piracy and other similar actions won't end when a couple bad apples get taken down, they'll end when media distributors improve their services. Every now and then, you'll see a story of some media company cracking down on piracy, but chances are that they could have prevented this level of piracy by improving some flaw in their service. This isn't to say that all piracy outlets are run by more really upstanding individuals, because some of them are absolute scum. But instead, these pirates are the inevitable result of shitty business practices. Hey, thanks for watching. This was done as an experiment of sorts to see what remaking one of my older videos would be like. I don't really talk about music that often, but if you're interested in hearing more of these crazy internet stories, maybe you should check out the rest of my videos. I've got big things planned for the coming months, so stay tuned.